Well, welcome back to another episode of Red Tinted Glasses. And for those of you watching on YouTube, will have got to see the winner in all its glory, filmed, of course, by Hannah McCook. Thank you very much, Hannah, for letting us use the video um, on our channel. And for those of you, unfortunately, maybe listening, will have got to hear the audio. If it sounds okay, um, we'll leave that one for Callum slightly later on. But Callum, what a way to win a football match. I know. I mean, it. So often when you go there, you think it needs a bit of a moment of magic, and uh, well, we we did get that, and um, we absolutely needed it. I think, you know, we played very well. Sometimes the finishing was lacking, but oh boy, what a bloody hit that was from Leighton Clarkson! And if there's a few more of them to come, I cannot wait. Yeah, and for those of you that are falling in love with Leighton Clarkson, stay tuned because later on in the episode, I caught up with Jack Gill, formerly of the Red Men TV, to look at a bit more in depth to what Leighton Clarkson can bring to the squad in our second of our Getting to Know You segments that we've managed to pull together. Um, and of course, uh, joined by Ewan Rankin from the Talk Livy podcast as he gives us a Livingston perspective ahead of the weekend's clash with the Lions. Of course, myself and Callum will look ahead to that game as well from an Aberdeen perspective, but we'll look back at the win at Perth at the weekend. And Callum, you had a, a fun journey to the game. I did not have a fun journey to the game, actually. Thanks very much. No thanks to yourself, Glenn. Um, I, I, th I think <laughs> what happened was you tweeted unbeknown to me to the Glen Office Red Supporters bus and then uh, they decided to put the podcast on on the bus and I was just absolutely mortified. Meanwhile, uh, Paul next to me, he was absolutely howling the whole time, loving it, thinking it's the most funny thing ever and I was just so unbelievably mortified. It was it was unreal, but... Um, it was all all in good jest and I uh, enjoyed my time on, on the Glen Rothes Reds bus as well. You know, there's a good sort of 20, 30 of them that go uh, from Glen Rothes to get the bus up to home games as well. So some mm -hmm. commitment from them. But uh, And they dug me out of a hole after the, the whole train faff, um, given they were all on strike on Saturday. But um, no, not the most uh, pleasant start to my Saturday. And good to know they've got good pre-match uh, taste uh, and that our scheduled tweets for a Saturday morning about folk tuning in uh, to our latest episode on the way to, to matches doesn't go uh, unlistened to. So uh, big up the Glen Roth and Reds. They've got a lot of good good lads in that, that group. So yes, in good chest. But um, yeah, uh, I can understand why you felt the way you did. But um, it was, of course, our first away league win since... Teddy Jenks' Hand of God goal at Perth on the 11th of December last year. Quite a long wait. Um, and like we said, yeah, a, a real moment of magic from, from Leighton Clarkson. Also, Callum, interestingly enough, the fifth, a w fifth win in five games of wearing our away kit this season and no goals conceded as well whilst wearing that away kit because I think it was picked up by a few that there was no need for us to be wearing white against St. Johnston at the weekend. Yeah, I was thinking that as well. I thought maybe, I mean, the St. Johnston goalkeeper was wearing red, but I mean, I'm sure he's got change kits. I don't know why, but um, it seems to be serving us well. Um, obviously, it has nothing to do with the clean sheet records and things like that, but we've got to keep any good omen going because uh, given our, our way performances and things like that, going into that game, we needed all the help we could get. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and in terms of team news, Johnny Hayes making his 300th appearance for the club. Um, quite the achievement for, for Johnny, um, making up that many appearances, obviously having his time away um, at Celtic in, in between, but, you know, really has been a good servant for the club, excluding that, that time at Celtic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I think he's probably maybe the best football's career of his, uh, since his return uh, right now, and um, very much well deserved 300 appearances and nice to mark it with a win uh, as well so um, I feel like I'm starting to appreciate John Hayes now more as, as he's going on uh, just like sometimes you know the end products maybe lack and sometimes he'll slice across in behind the goal but the work rate and you know effort he puts into things is just absolutely unmatched and you know finishing top of the fitness test and things like that ahead of some of the youngsters too still these days. I still think he's got a, a lot to give. Um, so, you know, very pleased for him and very pleased we managed to get a win uh, to celebrate that 300th appearance. 
Yeah, and also I think very shrewd as well of the club getting um, him signed up at, to be involved with the Youth Academy as well. Uh, you know, Stuart Duff um, as part of that, one of young brothers, and then you've got Johnny Hayes players that the, these youngsters coming through can, can look up to. And, and as you said, kind of Johnny's kind of been probably quite a model professional if you look back at what you just said there about his fitness and, and beating some of the young guys. So uh, hopefully a, a good a good role model that these guys can, can look up to um, in, in their early parts of their, their career. But also we also saw the return of Hayden Coulson um, coming in at left back. His dad did tell us in the DMs that he's a quick healer. And well, Steve, you're right. It was a very quick heal um, that um, Hayden produced. And, you know, arguably was up there for contending as man of the match for, um, you know, men in white, we should say, for this game. Absolutely. I think I was late to catch on to the uh, team news, admittedly, pre-match. However, I was surprised like that uh, he, he Hayden was in, included. And um, no, he delivered a very, very good performance. Did not look like someone just coming off the back of a, of a wee injury at all. Um, he, when he signed, he described himself to have fast feet. And I sort of thought, um, that's a weird way to describe yourself as a fullback. I've never heard that before, but... Uh, Absolutely true. There's a few moments, a uh, few glimpses in there showing showing what he can do uh, with, with the ball at his feet, a few bits of trickery. So uh, hopefully now with that injury beyond him, he can start to you know put appearances together and we can start to see the best of him. Yeah, and I suppose we kind of got glimpses of the best that Aberdeen could be. You know, it was a fairly comfortable game, I think it's safe to say. But given what we saw the week before, you know, some of the upset we've seen from some of the viewers and listeners sorry mal to, to lose you three episodes into the, the, the season but you know we needed that reaction along with the result and i think we got that in terms of both performance and of course picking up that all, all important three points certainly i think we looked a lot less shambolic at the back uh, I think that's maybe maybe the one word to describe that performance. I think it's Motherwell defensively. We looked a lot more organised. I mean, I, I suppose St. John's didn't, didn't really pose too much threat, but when they did, we dealt with it uh, fairly well. I thought the fullbacks did a little bit better defensively as well, um, You know, despite, again, not being tested too much. But it was better. It was, it was the, the reaction we, we absolutely needed, and thankfully we, we managed to pick up the result as well, um, albeit through. You know, a moment of magic from Leighton. But all round, I thought the performance was way, way, way better. Uh, and first, most importantly, we, we did exactly what we needed. Got our first away win of the season. And after how last season went, I, I wasn't even going to care what way it came. Um, so I'm just glad that, that that monkey's off the back sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose, yeah, you're right about both full backs because, you know, we have, well, we... I say we, I mean I, I've been quite critical of um, Jaden Richardson and you know even Jim Goodwin picking up on that point in his post-match comments about the fact that, that Jaden did come in for a lot of stick after last week's defeat and, and you know him along with a lot of other members of the squad responded well to that criticism and reacted to that defeat in the correct manner by going out there and, and putting in a performance um, to that level that's, that's earned us that win. And I think the other big change for me, Callum, from certainly from last week was the first time that that I saw us in league action at home. You know, you'd commented about the St. Minnan game as well. We started this game very much on the, the front foot. We didn't let St. Johnston settle in, in the early stages. And I think that really set the tone at the weekend. Yeah, I think it did. I mean, you know, fans were there in good numbers and, and, the, and the fact the team came out and responded to that uh, very well, just sort of, they sort of ended up pushing, pushing each other on to, to a degree. Um, it, 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 we, needed to, we needed to start like that, given how, how things have gone so far, you know, conceding inside three minutes at Celtic, slow starts uh, in, in following games. So it, 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 hopefully we can see that, you know, more from now on. And um, you know, we put St. Johnston to the sword. We, we knew what we were going to get out of the game against St. Johnston. They were going to sit in and try and make things difficult, be very, very compact, uh, very, very organised. Uh, and it's up to us to break it down. And thankfully, not only did we start well, we, we stuck to it as well and stuck to that game plan. And Jim Goodwin highlighted it after the game as well. You know, still with five minutes still, we're still trying to play it from the back and make things happen. So, uh, you know, try not to get too carried away, even though I always, always do. But um, much, much better this week. Yeah, I'm glad you could admit you always get carried away. And I think as well, you know, given the 
you know, the medical emergency that was taking place in the main stand and obviously the, the unfortunate circumstances that the, the person, you know, sadly passed away and our, our thoughts are with that person's family at, at this time because, you know, it's a, a real shame that, you know, he's gone to the football to do something I'm sure he enjoys doing and ne never made it home. So, you know, difficult circumstances for the players, I'm sure, to, to deal with. They'll have been aware of what was going on. So, a real sign of the professionalism to 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 get that focus back and, and focus on the job in hand. Yeah, I think so. Um, just very, very tough circumstances uh, all round, really. And it really is just a shame. Um, no, no one really go, deserves to go to the football uh, and not come home. So, uh, yeah, just sending those thoughts out there to the family. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and on Aberdeen's fast start, Calm, you know, Boya Mioski failing just to get on the end of a, a Vicente Bazao and cross, I think kind of summing up what day uh, Boyan was going to have. Um, just one of those days that nothing fell for him. Um, and then we admittedly forgot to do this segment last week, so mm -hmm. we'll issue a public apology on that. Um, my memorable moment from the game this weekend um, was when both Vicente and Boyan both going for spectacular overhead kicks, both missing the ball completely. But, you know, it kind of made me laugh because you said uh, on last week's episode that you were expecting Vicente to explode um, potentially this weekend against St Johnston. And when he goes up for that overhead kick, I thought, Jesus, Calm's going to be unbearable if he connects and this finds the back of the net. But... Um, both him and Boyan uh, do miss, and it was just—it was just kind of the comical nature for me um, that that stuck out around that. Obviously, I can laugh back at it now, knowing that we we've got the three points in the bag. But I do like the confidence that they've both shown in there, yeah. but, uh, and you know, not quite the explosion I, I was hoping for from Vinicius. We get maybe he's gonna maybe he's gonna explode from all that sticky toffee pudding he's been eating. Am I right, guys? Am I right? <laughs> Yeah, some good content there from the club as well, despite some people saying it wasn't the right time to put it out. But just again, showing Aberdeen fans can't be always happy at, th at things that the club put out. Almost never, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I think Vinny did too, but um, it, 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 I think the overhead kicks were still, however, more comical. Um, but I, I do, as I said, I do like the confidence that they both shown uh, in there and going for it and uh, then his time will come. I've got faith in him. Yeah. But um, Boyan did think his time had come this weekend. And once again, showing his presence in the air, latching onto a cross. But to be ruled out of his fifth goal of the season by the offside flag, I guess with you being at the game, you'll maybe not have had much sight about whether it was on or off, even watching on TV. I, I thought it was on on first viewing. And then on this first replay, I thought he's just off. And then I thought he was on. And, you know, it's those three letters that are going to come into play later on in the season, VAR. And I think that one would have been down to whose big toe was playing the others on or offside. I think so. I mean, it's often the case with Scottish football. Somehow the camera angles are always terrible and you can never <laughs> tell exactly because, you know, not, nothing's ever in line or anything like that. But... Um, good to see Boyan getting in the right position and finishing it off regardless, offside or not and annoying because it would have been a Johnny Hayes assist after I tipped it to be uh, to have the top assist to, uh, for Aberdeen this season um, but I don't think we'd be the only complaints about VAR this season, I think uh, next week's opposition with uh, Livingston will have some as well uh, given the way, the way things are going but um, it, it was a sign of encouragement uh, at the time, I couldn't tell when it was on, if it was onside or not the depth perception was all wrong. Whether that was entirely just from where I was sitting or not, I don't know. But, um, you know, it, it, it was, I think it was a sign of things to come and a sign of intent and, um, you know, got the crowd going a little bit more too as well. And good to see that Boyan finished it off regardless. Yeah, I, I will give the officials the benefit of that. I do think on the grand scheme of things, they probably got it just right this weekend. But yeah, if you do want to hear an extraordinary rant about um, how the Livy boys felt about their penalty award for Motherwell, make sure you tune into the, the Talk Livy podcast this week. But um, we didn't let it kind of affect us, Calm. We did keep, you know, pressing forward. And obviously this game was a reunion for Aberdeen and Andy Considine. And I did say in last week's episode that we could exploit Considine's lack of pace. You you struggled to agree. 
uh, or reluctantly agreed, maybe, we'll, we'll mm. say. Uh, and Vinny definitely targeted Considine, I think it's fair to say, in the early stages. And, and Andy really only had one option, and it seemed just to be fouling on every opportunity. I think so. And... Uh... I expect no less from Andy Considine. I think when you mentioned the point about his speed, I uh, struggled to admit, A, because it was you making a good point, and B, because it was my beloved Andrew Considine. But uh, ultimately, ultimately, you you were right. And yeah, he did resort, resort to some of that um, dirty tax. Maybe experience, you could, you could maybe put it down to that. That's how he was uh, dealing with it. But uh, a couple of fouls, he's maybe lucky not to get booked for the one where he sort of held it off Vinny, you know, just to get a body back. in the way. Yeah, just body checked him essentially. Uh, and then to obviously then go and get booked later on. So maybe lucky to still be on the pitch, but I would not have enjoyed seeing that man getting sent off regardless. Well, Agent Andy, you know, Declan Gallagher did it for us and look how much St Mirren have improved about him in the team. So, um, whoa, but... whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't <laughs> say they'd improve without Andy Considine. <laughs> but I think, you know, that kind of also summed up some of the discipline that St Johnson showed uh, in the game because there was a lot of heavy challenges. I think there were some challenges that were going in that they were lucky to escape bookings on in particular. But again, just a measure of the, the performance and maturity that, the, the, that we put in that we didn't kind of rise to some of the bait of the challenges and we just got on with the job at hand. Yeah, I, mean, I I think so. I think if you get drawn into a physical battle or things like that with St. Johnson, often more often than not, they pretty likely to come up top, especially given you know the soft touch maybe I would have been uh, the past sort of season or so. Um, so I think we did well to stick to our game plan because they will want us to, uh, to, to draw us in, throw us off, and stop us playing you know the, the progressive attacking free flowing whatever playing out from the back football. Uh, however you want to put it, they will want to throw us off that, and thankfully. That did not work, so credit to the team for the mentality, I suppose, uh, for that and, and, and discipline. And thankfully, we stuck to it and got our just desserts. Is that it? Yeah, good sticky toffee related pun that I'm sure you were fully intending there. Um, the shock on your face definitely means you weren't, but we'll go with it anyway. But also, the, the biggest difference, I think, as well from last weekend, once again, just highlights the importance of Ross McCrory into our midfield because we... I felt anyway that we dominated that midfield battle. Our defence, as you you said, was not as shambolic. It looked a lot more settled. Both full backs um, were very good, both defensively and going forward. And both that that scales Stuart partnership again looks very solid. Um, didn't really come with many many issues this weekend. Yeah, absolutely, which was surprising given how many issues we uh, created for ourselves against Motherwell. But um, I, I think the protection of uh, Ramadani and McCrory being in there will definitely have helped as well. So sort of, if, if one of the full-backs goes or if both of them go, there is still sort of that cover in the middle as well. But I also think with McCrory being in there, it allowed Leighton Clarkson to have a lot more freedom. Uh, I think mm -hmm. we saw sort of more what he was capable of that we did against Motherwell, first of all, for obvious reasons with the free kick, but even out with that, um, yeah. you know, um, the ball he slipped through that Boyan couldn't get quite get on to. He, he had a couple of shots from distance, one dragging one wide. He was very unlucky with that one. Um, it's just very, very positive. And um, I, I'm just, we look so much unbelievably better with Ramadani in alongside McCrory. And God, I hope yeah. think we can stick with that. Yeah, and I think, you know, that was a good point on Leighton as well because he does, or he did, get that much more freedom to kind of roam around the midfield, or, you know, sweep things up defensively if Ramadani was caught high up the pitch or looked to kind of be that out ball for Ramadani to then drive into into that open space up front to, to link up with, with Boyan as well. And, yeah, it just highlights how important Ross is to that, that middle of the park. And, you know, Jim Goodwin does say that he wants another creative midfielder, but given how much we've already had to change our defence this season and, and move around Ross McCrory, I, I'd almost argue that defensive cover is of more importance. I, I would definitely agree, um, absolutely. Because, I mean, if Richardson gets injured, it's going to be McCrory. He has to slip in there. Stewart, it's almost definitely going to be McCrory because you're not going to trust David Bates and it has to be a right-sided uh, centre-back as well. 
it just throws everything off and it throws off the balance. And then if it's just Ramadani and it's that sort of tough midfielder in the middle of the park, it leaves him with a lot to do. Where mm -hmm. in, in this league, the, the games are often won in the middle of the park. Uh, you know, the physical nature, who can control it the most. It, I, th I would much prefer some defense, uh, some defensive cover in there because not only that. Um, if, if we sign on the midfielder with compete with Leighton Clarkson, you still got Connor Barron to come back in uh, as well. Yeah, and I suppose on Connor Barron as well, I think you know he's going to still be out for another couple of months. So even as you know, I think someone in the comments, uh, Paul Donaldson, normally comments on a lot of our videos on YouTube, and he made a good point about Jaden Richardson picking up bookings. So it's not even injuries that we might have to to deal with at right back at suspension and. You know, both games this season in the league when we've moved Ross McCrory out of midfield, we've gone on to lose. So I don't really like the the way that adds up if that's going to be the continuing theme. No, it's becoming quite the pattern, isn't it? Um, but uh, that's a good point about Jim Richardson's booking, Jed. I hadn't, hadn't actually considered that. And um, I think we are, we are looking like And also, regardless of injuries or suspension, just some competition in there for him too. I think yeah. I think it would be uh, beneficial. And But... These things will come. There will be uh, games he misses through one way or another. And we can't be changing everything but just because there's one player out of the defence missing and having to change the mm -hmm. midfield and everything like that as well. Even worse than any of that happening, if Ross McCrory gets injured, <laughs> then that, that this you know, one-stop shop for the stopgap, if he's gone, then what happens? Yeah, Yeah, so we probably do need... I, I guess that's where you know Jim Goodwin sees another midfielder coming in as maybe filling in for if we need to drop Ross McCrory back. But yeah, if, if the stars were really to unalign and we got both him injured and needed him at cover at the same time, but I think that just shows you know it, it, this isn't us being critical of Aberdeen or, or of Jim Goodwin right now, but it just shows that we're not yet the finished package. There is work still to be done in the transfer market. There is still work to be done on this squad as a whole and you know that bump in the road that, that last week was against Motherwell could still be on on the horizon if we don't sort these kind of gaps that we still need to fill between now and the, certainly the, the transfer window in August closing. Yeah definitely I mean to be fair to give Jim Goodwin's credit he has done very well in one window to turn it to turn it around, although you know it's still early days and things and things like that. I think the, the, just the feeling amongst the fans right now is feeling a lot, lot, lot better than, for example, after that Ross County game last season. Um, so uh, credit us that this where credit bit, 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 credit credits due. Goodness me, that was bad. Um, but uh, you know, I think he, it will take another window or two, uh, even after this one. But I just. I just would like to see some sort of defensive cover come in in some capacity, just to just to put my mind at ease, if nothing else. Yeah, but um, one player that has come in and put a lot of people's mind to ease is, of course, Leighton Clarkson, and he opened the goal scoring, as we said already, in quite spectacular fashion. Um, Johnny Hayes was brought down rather cynically by by Graham Carey, of course, already on a booking, um, avoiding. A, a second booking and Jim Goodwin I, I did enjoy his post-match comments saying I was just really hoping that Johnny did not step up and take it of course on his 300th appearance maybe looking for his name up in lights um, on that occasion uh, Jim's seen the quality that Leighton's had obviously Leighton himself saying he's been working on free kicks and training learnt from Steven Gerrard and well a lot of comparison to a former England loanee we've had James Madison, where do you compare that free kick to the one that Madison scored? Madison's once against Rangers and up tawdry and in, in off the in off the post or bar, whatever it was. I can certainly see the comparisons. For me, Madison still tops it, obviously. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to give you know Leighton Clarkson the recency bias, but you know if he can keep these things up, then I'm sure he will probably go on to be held in even higher esteem. Uh, than James Madison, but I mean, it, it was it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, someone did say to me, I said, I usually play a game when there's a free kick and it's stand or wall, and you predict whether it's mm. going to hit the stand, uh, go at the stand or hit a wall. So I said that, and then the boy next to me just went, James Madison. And then <laughs> lo and behold, flying into the top corner, it goes, and I look like a fool, but didn't care. It, it was absolutely brilliant. And he's delivered two fantastic. Fantastic goals 
so far uh, in the season. If, if we, and, you know, another couple uh, between now and the end of the season, um, and I hate to say it, nobody recall him, uh, Jurgen Klopp, then I will be very happy. Yeah, um, I did bring that up with Jack in the segment that's coming up about Liverpool and recalling loan players from Aberdeen. Um, he did say they were struggling midfield slightly, but let's hope that's not enough to, to recall Leighton. Um, but yeah, it's funny, I also like playing that game when we get free kicks about whether it's going to hit the wall or go over the the, uh, the barn. Like Matty Kennedy's last week, um, we, we did that, the, the four of us that were in the red shed, and I did say he was going to balloon it over the bar. And lo and behold, that's what he did. But uh, what about in comparison to his goal against Submirin? Where do you rank that free kick? As I saw you and Stuart um, uh, replying to a tweet about that. What, what's your thoughts on that? I don't know. It's tough because the technique required for the goal against Submirin is astounding. To keep it low, so driven, so accurate, obviously that, that takes you know immense talent to do. But also... The dead ball to lift it up over the wall to get it, you know, fly into that top corner with perfect actually could barely be it more in the top corner. It's tough, and I, I think I, I think I will give it to the free kick. This is it's Johnston goal, just also because it gave us the win. You know, good travelling support as well, first away mm-hmm. win of the season. I think I'm going to give it to that one. Uh, you know, it's maybe a bit closer in terms of quality, but just for how it what it meant, I'm going to give it to the, the second goal. Yeah, and I tend to agree, and I think Leighton said the same in his post-match comments as well. He, he probably prefers that goal. I mean, I'm sure he enjoys both of them just as much, but prefers that that goal on Saturday because it meant something more. It was the, the game-winning goal. Um, and yeah, I think certainly, you know, that video that we've put out in the, the start of the, the episode over on, on YouTube, or if you're watching um, with us here on YouTube, the, the angle that Hannah's filmed that at is obviously right behind the goal. It's a really good good angle and it almost looks like he's not only gone over the wall but he's gone around it in a sense as well so to get that whip pace power to beat the keeper and put it precision even to put it into the the top corner is just a bit of quality that the volley is i think you know you were right in your assessment of that but there's there's nothing more pleasing than watching a free kick from distance fly into the top corner yeah, I think so. There's just that sort of expectation as everyone watches it flying through the air and uh, waiting for it to, to hit the back of the net. But at the same time, I, I suppose then there's also, you know, with St. Mirren goal, there's the fact he's, he's come on, it's his debut, he's signed within the last 24 hours, but I'm still going to stick with St. John's in one. But, you know, the fact we can even have this debate when, you know, the signing came out of nowhere, I won't lie, never heard of him in my life, and now he, he's the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah, but you could also argue that about Hayden Coulson as well. You know, probably another signing that went under the radar, a signing that wouldn't, um, you know, was maybe underwhelming with the greatest respect to Hayden and Steve, if you're listening, apologies. Um, but, but, you know, showing that character to come back from injury, you know, maybe people will have said he was rushed back from injury. We saw what happened last season with Jack McKenzie and there was actually, I think, a moment in the first half as well when... Um, I remember on Red TV, he was biting the top of his shirt in almost a bit of like grimace and hobbling. I thought, oh, oh, here we go again. We've rushed a player back too soon. But he fought through that barrier. And and as like I said, at the kind of the top of the show, arguably could have been up there for, for a man of the match. I'm sure Leighton will be wanting it for, for his goal that he scored. But again, you know, we, we spoke about McCrory and the importance that he brought to our midfield having Hayden Coulson on that left side of our defence is just as important because it offered us a balance in terms of our fullbacks pushing on and I think helps us certainly create chances. Yeah, absolutely. I think also not only the balance uh, of the fullbacks, there's also the balance of the centre-backs, one being able to play on his left, one being able to play on his right. Maybe, I mean, you know, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself there uh, with Anthony Stewart, but um, you know, it's certainly a, a, a Fantastic performance from Hayden Coulson. You know, that's him getting back to sharpness after, you know, kind of being thrown in uh, originally when he first signed and then the injury is a setback. Um, that, that can't be easy to get over sort of mentally. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and he's done that to deliver a fantastic performance. I, I certainly look forward to seeing a lot more. And, you know, hopefully with, with a settled back four uh, of those, those four, we can really start to see um, things improving back there as well as going forward, of course. 
<clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, Anthony Stewart, we were probably critical of. And, you know, for those that, that do tune in to our show on a more regular basis and, and did listen to the the uh, episode we did in pre-season with George from the Wickham Way, he did say he is not a ball-playing centre-back. He is more of a, a no-nonsense, would prefer to get rid of it. And I, I think, you know, I, I saw Chidi N. McCauley tweet, not that Chidi N. McCauley, for those maybe new to um, the show or not regularly on, on Twitter, uh, make a point about, despite the criticism, he is still solid in dealing with a lot of the aerial bombardment that comes into our box. And I think actually that is a really excellent point because we didn't necessarily deal with that side of uh, an opposition attack last season very well. And we do look a lot more solid in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anyone who's not tuned into Twitter will have no, like be so confused that you've just said Chidi and Wakali, not that Chidi and Wakali as if they're thinking there's another Chidi and Wakali. <laughs> Aberdeen, what's going on? They'll be very confused. <laughs> Uh, so I'll offer up some clarification. Twitter page, they've just called themselves Chidi and Wakali. I don't know why, but there we go. That's why. So that's the explanation I'll give you just for the benefit. Uh, those not too tuned in in terms of uh, the Twitter sphere. Can't believe I just said that. I feel so old. <laughs> Anthony Stewart. <laughs> I've lost the plot now. Anthony Stewart. No, yes. Uh, critical of his ball playing. Probably should have known better. Did expect a little bit better in terms of against Motherwell. In fact, just the fact he'd be able to pass to a man, that would have been good. But in terms of, you know, defending the box, being that no wrongs at centre back, I've got to give him the credit. Um, whereas, yeah, I think that's the reason why Papal calls him Vincent Company because very rarely loses out on a header. And it's posi- not only that, but his positioning for it as well when it's coming into the box is very good. So, yes, credit does have to go to him for that. So if we've got, you know, the ball playing of Liam Scales and then Anthony Stewart like that, in theory, put them together and they can play together when they can well when they can play together and we can do it often as much as possible with the full backs as well and it all gels nicely we could be in a good spot and I'm hesitant because it's Aberdeen and given how bad we've been defensively but I'm trying to be hopeful given how negative I was last week yeah or we both were last week um but you know we continued that press after after the goal ross mccrory going close boy and Mioski maybe should do better with his chance but i think remy matthews you've got to give credit to him he was very much helpless at the goal but a very good save to deny the macedonian who just wasn't his day um and it, again not through a lack of trying um on on his behalf um we also once again saw the emergence of Jim Goodwin failing to understand five subs. It was just the three. Uh, I, I noticed when I was doing the notes, I would mention that because I knew how much you would pick up on that. But again, impressive cameos from Shaden Morris and Duke as well. Um, probably on both seeing that that rawness to them, especially I think Shaden in terms of his finishing with the, the chances that he, he had, you know, give him more minutes and, and game time maybe finds the back of the net with one of those opportunities towards the back end of the game? I think Jim Goodwin is just old school, maybe, and he just hates the <laughs> fact he can make five substitutions and just refuses to do it. Maybe that's what it is. But uh, no, Shannon Morris, yeah, he came on, he was lively. Uh, I thought he did actually offer us a, a pretty good out ball, you know, towards mm-hmm. towards the, the end of the game. And, um, you know, just with, with that pace against a tiring and ageing de- St. Johnston defence, um, and yeah, you know, could have done better with with uh, the couple of chances that he had, perhaps. Uh, would probably have liked to have finished off one of them, and that would have sort of tied up the game uh, perfectly. But regardless, getting in those positions, causing problems, uh, giving us another option off the bench, don't mind it at all. And and on Duke, I hope by now he's worked out that people are yelling Duke and not booing him. I hope that <laughs> that's been explained to him by now. Um, you know, he he had a chance, flashed ahead or wide. But what I was really impressed with was his hold-up play. Mm-hmm. At one point, I noticed he was practically squatting to hold off uh, the St. Johnston number five and it gave him an absolute torrid time. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, he's not particularly tall, but boy, does he make up for it uh, with, with his physique and strength. Um, and I thought it was basically exactly what we needed at, at that moment in the game. So credit goes to them and hopefully they, they can ca- carry on this and... Um, carry on building those understanding, picking up those sharp, uh, that sharpness as well. Um, yeah, so there, was, there, was also, there was also one moment as well where he kind of dilly-dallied on the ball, 
got caught in possession and Jim Goodwin went absolutely mm-hmm. ballistic. But instead of, you know, oh, I've lost the ball, he just ran straight for the ball, made the slide tackle on the halfway line and the ball went out for a St Mirren throw in. So stopped any, you know, quick possibility of St Mirren countering there. So, mm-hmm. and I think it was also picked up last week as well, you know, when Kel Roos was up for the corner that, that Duke was the first man back to tackle mm-hmm. Kevin Van Bain. So, you know, he's not afraid of tracking back and, and you know, making up if he does um, lose possession. But on Cal Roos as well, you know, maybe not his best outing against Motherwell, although we could say that for a lot of players. Yeah. Not a lot to do on Saturday. St. Johnson just having one shot on target. And that one shot on target did require a good save from Cal Roos. And I think it's important that in a game of that nature, when he really didn't have a lot to do, still kept that concentration level high to, to make that save from Jamie Murphy. Because that was, you know, with seven minutes to go, if that goes in, you're thinking, oh, we've given ourselves not a lot to go and grab a winner. So, you know, we've done well at the top end and also defensively this weekend. Yeah, I mean, I, the fact that, you know, we've kept, kept his concentration throughout the game despite having, not having too much to do. Um, so, so credit has to go in for Give, go to him for that. I am all over the shop today. <laughs> but um, yeah, fantastic stop. I, th- I did think when I saw Jamie Murphy sort of skip past a couple of Aberdeen players, I was like, oh, here we go. But thankfully, <laughs> Kelly met, met with a big, strong hand. And uh, I think that'll give his, confiden- uh, give his confidence a boost as well. You know, a clean sheet, uh, albeit, you know, we didn't have that much to do. But there was sort of another one where uh, I think in the first half, it would have been, yes, uh, where he sort of got down low to his left and held it. I think it was going wide anyway, but had mm-hmm. he not held it, there was a St. Johnston player coming in, uh, hoping you know, for Kelly to spill it. So um, all credit to him, hopefully, um, you know, that, that will give his confidence a boost. But ultimately, got earned, got us the three points that saved too. Yeah, exactly. Three points, clean sheet, up the road. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Livingston this weekend. But before we look at the Livingston game, I caught up with former Academy TV host and member of the Red Men TV um, YouTube channel, Jack Gill, to get the lowdown on Liverpool Loney Leighton Clarkson. Jack, welcome along to Red Tinted Glasses. Good to get you on and get maybe a bit more of a deeper knowledge of Leighton Clarkson because he's fair introduced himself to the Aberdeen faithful with two stunning goals so far in his early career. Yeah, um, he's, he's, he's some little player, I, I tell you that. Um, I don't know if you or your listeners know much about me, but to explain my, my background and, and why it's best that I, I've come on and done this really. Um, so I used to do stuff for the Redmen TV and, and work close alongside the academy. I, I brought in a, an academy channel for us. Um, and yeah, I watched the the youngsters uh, play for Liverpool a lot. So when we went through those phases where we were playing in the cups and, and using our young lads a lot, I was I was the go to man for for the knowledge on on the academy. And Leighton Clarkson is is a name that I've had my eye on for a while. He's he's a superb talent. Um, I know we're going to talk about him more in a moment, but somewhat surprised that he ended up in, in Scotland on loan. Somewhat surprised about the Blackburn loan not going to plan as well. Um, but he's an excellent player and there's a couple of things he needs to work on. Um, one of which I don't think necessarily is a fault of his own, um, but he could be an excellent talent. Yeah. Um Obviously, his loan at Blackburn didn't work out. What what was it for you, or was there an extenuating circumstance that that meant the loan didn't work out? I think it's a mixture of things. Uh, I think it was t- he came late in a window. I think Tony Mowbray is is an old fashioned manager who who doesn't like to change too much, and he had a midfield that was working pretty well. Um, I think also it's a physicality thing, um, and personally, I think that's why he's gone to Scotland on loan. Um, I don't watch too much Scottish football, but from what I know of, of, of Scottish football, the, the league's quite a physical league. Um, and I think throwing Leighton Clarkson over there is, is going to get him really used to, to, to the physical side of, of first-team football. Um, something that I think Tony Mowbray has said he's lacked and, and, and Leighton himself has, has said he lacks. 
And I mean, you just have to look at Leighton for that, really, don't you? You know, he, he looks like a bit of a prepubescent teenager. Um, and, you know, he's, he's a young lad. And I saw when, obviously, Trent Alexander-Arnold came in and broke into the first team. He looked very skinny, very lean at first. But over a year or two, he bulked up massively. And, and I'm hoping Leighton can do the same. Um, we're going to talk more about positions in a minute, but... Part of the reason I think he's better suited to to the the number six role is because of that physicality thing. It's not necessarily something you need as much. You look at Fabinho for for us, who, in my opinion, is is the best holding midfielder in the league. Maybe one of the best in the world, the best in my opinion. But I'm a biased yeah. red. Um, he's quite a, a slender man as well, and and though he's he's a lot taller than Leighton, um, it, it shows that you can be slender and and still, um, you know, be an excellent number six. And and that's where I think. Leighton's future is though I've noticed he's, he's been playing a bit more advanced for you hasn't he? Yeah he's kind of trying to work out where he's been playing um, mm. for us um, I, I felt certainly on Saturday's game he was had a bit more of a freer role when we managed to get Ross McCrory back into to midfield but yeah we'll come on to kind of physicality and yeah. I think it's an interesting point you, you pick up there about him coming to Scotland because that is something we always say is a more physical league than down south um, and a, a lot of young English players have now come up to Scotland to maybe gain that bit of experience you know I think back to James Madison's time when he came on loan to Aberdeen and he was a very slight figure that liked throwing himself about maybe you know got a bit of a reputation and now look at the the career he's kind of built for himself off of that loan spell. I'd like to think we've helped him on his way um, a little bit. But, you know, listening to, to Leighton after the game on, on Saturday, you know, he's spoken a lot about the work he did at, at Liverpool, working alongside Steven Gerrard, um, who was, of course, a youth coach um, before joining Rangers. Um, he's also had first team experience making his debut in the, the League Cup quarter final against Aston Villa and a year later um, um, making the Champions League squad against Michelin. So, you know, He's been in around first team environment, you know, players like Mo Salah, Fabinho, you've mentioned as well, learning off of Steven Gerrard for someone I know you'll probably speak very highly of um, from a Liverpool point of view. But just how much will Leighton learn off of those players and do you think can bring to Aberdeen as well? He'll learn a lot, but I'll tell you the best attribute of Leighton, it's, it's his knowledge as it is of the game. Um, and you know he, he's he's lucky that he's got those those former players such as Gerard who who have made a big impact on his career. Um, he's also had glowing references from from our um, assistant manager Pep Linders. He speaks very highly of him and his, his footballing brain. Um, and you can see it when when you watch him play. Uh, you know he's when when I used to watch him play for for our youth sides. He, he was two, three, four, five steps ahead of, uh, of a lot of other players his age. Um, just, the, you know, the quick thinking, um, seeing passes that, that other people may not see. Um, I know Pep Linders spoke about how he, he just seemed to be on the same wavelength as, as players like uh, Salah and Mane, which just shows that he's got that, that world-class bit about him, really. Um, and, you know, I, I don't like saying that about youngsters, but with Leighton, you, you watch him and, and you can see he's got that that knowledge that you need to, to make it as a footballer. Um, and I've always thought really, really highly of him. Um, the fact he's been able to work under Gerrard, I think, really helped him improve his game massively. Um, you know, say what you want about Steven Gerrard as a manager. I know he's not doing too well at Aston Villa at the moment, but with our youth team, he, he seemed to really improve some of our younger players. Um, Leighton being one of them, I think it says a lot that Klopp played him in the Champions League. Not many youngsters get an experience in the Champions League. And I think he's he's just a, a, an exceptional talent. And, and for everyone involved in Liverpool, it's it's easy to see that, you know, in the games that he has played for us, he's been thrown in in the deep end and, and he's played really, really well. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot more to come for him in his future, whether that's at Liverpool, I, I don't know. But I, I know he's going to be a talented, talented player in the future. Yeah, you know, kind of saying that, you know, glimpses of world-class ability and you could see that in the two goals he scored for us already. Um, you know, they are world-class finishes and, mm. you know, had they been by a bigger name, you know, I, you know, no disrespect to Leighton Clarkson in his early stage of the career, you'd probably see a lot more coverage all over social media, not just on on the Aberdeen feeds um, that, that we saw at the weekend. 
you know, it, it's interesting to see that there's a lot of confidence um, from the Liverpool backroom staff. And I'm just maybe intrigued on the back of, you know, your signing of Calvin Ramsey from us and us now getting Leighton Clarks and if there's maybe going to be some kind of work done in the future around maybe Liverpool youngsters coming the way of Aberdeen. But I just hope you don't ruin our season like you did last and last time we loaned somebody from Liverpool when Danny Ward was recalled in January and sat on the bench and kind of derailed our season slightly. Yeah, apologies for that. But you've given us someone who's broken by the sounds of it with Calvin Ramsey. So I, I think we're even there now. But um, but yeah, to, to be honest with with um, the, the relationship that you said between the two clubs, that's something that I've always thought we should probably see more in football because like you say there, you get a lot of, of youth players that come through and, and don't yet have the physicality that you need to, to, to make it as a Premier League player. And mm -hmm. the Scottish League, I think, is, is a great league to, to send players to when you want them to, to bulk up a bit and, and learn about the physical side of the game. Um, you know, you only have to watch some of the games at the weekend, the Celtic game, two sendings off, Rangers game, two sendings off. It's it's a physical, physical league and, and Leighton Clarkson will learn quickly playing their week in week out what it's like to play first team football and what it's like to be a bit more physical and then hopefully he'll come back and he'll have learned oh shit there's there's some big guys and I, I need to bulk up a bit and, and then hopefully he'll, he'll bulk up a bit and you know it, for him to to bulk up a bit and, and get a bit more muscle on him and, and, and to also have the football in brain he's got I think you've got an excellent player there. Yeah, and you know, you know, one player that we kind of compared him to, I think it was based on kind of coverage that you guys had done on the Red Men TV, and um, we mentioned on the podcast a couple of weeks ago was um, when my friend Johnny Bain said that it was kind of almost like a comparison to Billy Gilmore. That's what he felt when he was watching kind of some of the videos. Do you see? Uh, do you see kind of where people are drawing that sort of similarities? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know. Billy Gilmore's a, another player, isn't he? He's, he's quite slender, and and he also uh, obviously has played in the Scottish League before, I believe, with Rangers. Um, so I, I think it's it's difficult for Leighton Clarkson, I think, because you know it's it, it's it's difficult being uh, someone who necessarily isn't uh, blessed with a, a physique that that makes him look like a footballer. Um, but he, he does have the, the the raw talent and technique there, like like Billy Gilmore does. I think Billy Gilmore as well is, is an excellent player. He's had slightly more opportunities with, within the first team. He's further in his career than Leighton Clarkson, but I think Leighton Clarkson will, will, will get there. And I think yeah. this is the first step for him in, in what is going to be a, a terrific career. You know, he's had glimpses. He, he's played big moments. He's, uh, you know, made his debut in the Champions League, um, which, as I said earlier, is a massive achievement. He's, he's played in the League Cup quarter final. Um, you know, I, I, I have big, big expectations from Leighton Clarkson, but I think this is the first step. And I think you Aberdeen fans now are starting to see what I was telling many Liverpool fans a few years ago of, of the things he was doing in the academy and, and how good he was looking. And I think maybe not necessarily on a goal scoring front. I think, I think that's a, yeah. bit, a bit of something new for Leighton, but um, yeah, he's, he's always had that in, that in him. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, you know, well, with, he's also had international recognition at the under 20. So I suppose if he keeps this level of performance up, hopes of maybe even breaking into the, the under 20 ones will be certainly on his mind as well. But, you know, you've obviously seen a lot of Leighton in terms of academy. Where would you say he's best suited to in terms of that midfield? Um, well, f f I've always said the, the, the number six position. Um, you know, I think I think he can play box to box, but I think because of the the, the knowledge of the game from him, he's very good in that holding role as well. Um, I mean, the, the best person to ask is he's probably Leighton himself yeah. um, because he'll know where, where he's happiest playing. But from what I've seen, I always thought there. Um, but I think that's because in our academy, we, we also had a good number eight that we put alongside him. Um, and, you know, it, I, I think it worked really well with him holding. And, and that year when, when they were in the academy together, him and Jake Kane was outstanding. We played some really, really good football. Um, I think, as you've seen, he, he's shown that he can score very good goals. Um, so he's clearly very good in a in in a box to box kind of position as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he'd suit a double pivot really, really well. Um, so I, I think that's really good. That I can't answer your question with yeah. one position, Glenn, to be honest, because 
you know, if you'd have asked me before watching his, his three games for Aberdeen and uh, I've been keeping an eye on how he's been doing and, and watching the Aberdeen highlights afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think he's a, he's a player who I would have said before that is, is certainly a six, but now mm-hmm. I'm starting to see his, his box-to-box abilities as well. And, and that's just, for me, summing him up as a player where if you put him in a certain role, he'll do his very best and he'll shine there too. Yeah, yeah. As I think, you know, the the Motherwell game you can maybe take out with a lot of players had an off day, and maybe, you know, that the game passed late and by it a little bit. But as I said everyone had an off day, but we're seeing certainly the potential in when you've got someone that can hit a dead ball like Leighton can. And I, I like how he's very fearless, and um, when he has that opportunity to to get a shot away, he won't shirk away from it. You know, won't maybe make the pass to another player. He takes the game by the scruff of the neck and, and really goes for it. So certainly some encouraging signs and we've certainly gained a lot of Liverpool followers um, in recent weeks on the back of the, the goals he's scoring. And um, I hope that he continues to go strength to strength for us. And we get the, as I said, we get the benefit for the whole season from him, not just half a season. And, and likewise, I hope Callum Ramsey makes a quick recovery and you guys can actually see the benefits of what we saw last season from Calvin Ramsey at, at some stage. Well, there's a um, there's obviously a midfield issue at Liverpool at the moment, so you never know, mate. Uh, he might be back quicker than you, than you think. Um, but no, I, I think you'll you'll keep late, and I think, as I say, there's things that he needs to work on. Physicality being one of those, and I think you'll have him for the full season. Calvin Ramsey, as well. Just want to touch on him. He's a player that I'm really looking forward to seeing. Um, I went to Greece earlier on in the year with with the misses and, and bumped into an Aberdeen fan there who, who gave me a glowing reference of, of Calvin Ramsey. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, he, he recovers quickly. Luckily enough, he's, he, his role is to play understudy to the best right back in world football. So you know, we don't need him that quickly, but it would be nice to give Trent a rest at times, I suppose. And and it's Seems now that we've got a, 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 an understudy for for Trent, who, who is a pretty much like for like in terms of stylistically. Um, so yeah, looking forward to seeing him, um, and I'll be keeping close eyes on well both eyes on on Aberdeen and how they do this season, hoping that Leighton Clarkson continues to shine. Yeah, well, hopefully, and uh, hopefully this has passed some time for you because I know um, you've got a big game to look forward to tonight and I know the nerves will be kicking in. So yeah, <laughs> hope that worked well for you and um, likewise the rest of the season for Liverpool as well. But Jack, thanks very much for taking the time this evening to, to speak to me about Leighton Clarkson. Fantastic. Cheers, Glenn. Thanks again to Jack for his thoughts. Of course, we did hope to bring you that when Leighton signed, but a mixture of holiday and work schedules meant... We had to wait until Leighton already has made quite a good impression, Callum, but nevertheless, good to get a bit more insight onto kind of his upbringing through the Liverpool ranks uh, and his a little bit more positional sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be fair, we'd better to, to, to learn more about him when he's just rifled a free kick into the top corner to give us our first win of the season. Exactly. Um, and let's hope he saving another cracker for this weekend as I said Livingston make the trip up north looking to bounce back from that controversial defeat that they suffered against Motherwell but of course we are looking for a bit of continuity continuity god we're both having a good we're both having a good episode you can tell how unedited we make these shows but I think it's important this weekend Calm, that we do build on that win from St Johnson especially at home where, you know, Jim Goodwin's keen to make Pataudry a fortress. It is important that we back up not only the clean sheet, but the three points as well. And, you know, even if we can get another clean sheet this weekend, that'll do our defence the world of good. Absolutely. I mean, you know, with the blip against Motherwell, um, and after our bold predictions prior to, to that game about how this month was going to go, um, fantastic to get the away wing against St Johnson, but we do need to go and follow it up and you know get our first two consecutive uh, you know, league wins of the season. And at home in front of a, of a good crowd, I'm sure, unfortunately, a crowd I will not be in because I'm going to Lee's Festival to see Jack Carlo. Oh, wait, no, he pulled out. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Wouldn't have bothered going otherwise. But regardless, I, I unfortunately will not be there. We will have a stand-in um, for the review show. But hopefully, when I'm ch- trying gasping for a signal to see what the score is, I'll be met with uh, back-to-back Aberdeen wins. 
yeah, um, shout out to, to Phil Mayer, um, of course, who was a respectable stand-in in your place at the end of last season, is ready to make his substitute appearance this season uh, and come on and he will be joining me to look back at the Livingston game. And we've also got an Annan fan uh, lined up who will be speaking to um, at some point over the weekend uh, as part of the preview for the Cup game, because, of course, this is the first spell where we face three games in seven days. So a real test for the squad, some of the fitness issues, thinking to look at Hayden Coulson about him maybe. Again, with the Annan game coming up, maybe around the ankle injury, a plastic pitch coming up, there might be some changes around that. I'm not too sure, but I guess, Calm this game, I don't really see there being too much change to our, our starting lineup. I can't, I can't see why after a performance like that, away from home, getting the three points, um, I, f- I felt the balance of the team and things like that worked work very well. And S- Livingston might set up in a pretty similar way to St Johnston, you know, with them being away from home uh, at this time. They'll look to be compact, although, you know, admittedly they do have um, at least one massive problem up the top mm-hmm. end of the park. So, um, you know, things will be slightly different. But I can't see the reason for us to, to change anything's anything and um, you know we had a good combination of creativity in the middle of the park with with Leighton Clarkson you know the doggedness perhaps of uh, Ramadani and McCrory their energy to get up and down the park and support the forward players and back to defend and then um, you know the wide play Hayes, Basawin and of course Boy Miofsky we all know is going to start up top so I can't see any real reason to change it and uh, hopefully they can get through the week without any, any injuries. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, to go back to the point we keep kind of reiterating about that partnership, it gives those another game to, to build and hopefully we continue to see um, and reap the benefits of those partnerships and, and Leighton Clarkson continuing to go sh- from strength to strength. Because I think it was fair to say on Saturday he had that bit more of a freer role um, with that, that partnership that McCrory and Ramadani have got and and we, we again got the benefit of that. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the game this weekend, hopefully, um, with a bit more confidence than I was last weekend when we, of course, reviewed. And and I caught up with, with Ewan from the Talk Livy podcast to hear the news from the Livingston camp and how they've been preparing for this week's game, as well as how their season has been going so far. Yes, by popular demand, the fan opposition view is back and returning our, our favourite guys from Livingston. It's Ewan Rankin from the Talk Livy podcast. Ewan, welcome back to Red Tinted Glasses. Thank you very much for, for having me back on. I'm surprised after me probably slating Aberdeen on previous podcasts and when you've come and featured on ours, I'm surprised I'm allowed back on. But there you go. <laughs> I know, exactly. And it's uh, strange to see us back both behind the screen because it was, uh, of course, in, in June we met each other in person for the first time after doing this for a good couple of years and featuring on each other's podcasts. So uh, good that despite the trip to Dublin and some boozy memories, we've still remained friends and able to help each other out. I know uh, it is bizarre that it's taken us to go to a different country to actually meet up with each other. It's uh, probably similar similar time travelling as it takes Angus to get to to get to Aberdeen on yeah, his exactly. four five hour trek up there. But yeah, it's a uh, Scotland duty. It's the it's the beauty of it. The the trip tends to be better than the football, which was certainly the case. Certainly was, yeah, yeah. But I know exactly Angus uh, and the rest of the Livy faithful do have that four or five hour trip to look forward to up to the northeast as Livingston make their way to Pataudry this weekend. Um, obviously, you and you're here to to help give us a Livingston perspective ahead of the weekend's fixture. But let's look first at your thoughts on what has been the summer transfer window and, of course, the, the Premier Sports group stages. What, what have been your thoughts on the, this transfer activity at Livingston and obviously progression in the in the cup? Yeah, I think in terms of the, the business that Davey's done over the window, I think he, he said it at the tail end of last season, despite the, the popular narrative that we're a bunch of hammer throwers and big and physical. I mean, the average height of our midfield is about five foot seven. And <laughs> again, the popular narrative that we seem to be spectacular at set plays, again, is very, very false if you look at our stats the last two seasons. So I think Davey was wanting to add a little bit of height into the team in terms of the market in the summer, which uh, he has done. Scott Sindhu coming in, who's you know six foot four, Philip Kinkar centre half from uh, Western Sydney Wanderers has come in as well. Now Ismail Goncalves is maybe a little bit more physical up the top end of the park and Dylan Bahambula who's come in as well is again six foot two adds 
a little bit more height to the team. So Davies essentially performed what his remit was. I think for the first time in a while, we've not had a lot of players leaving the club. I think the, the two the two that featured most in the team last year were probably Odin Bailey and Alan Forrest. Odin Bailey's gone back down to Birmingham and Alan mm-hmm. Forrest is signed for Hearts. They're the two that were a regular on the side last year that have moved on. Max Stryek, which I, I know is a popular player up in Aberdeen for some of the gifts he gave you last season. He's also moved on, but I think we've, no disrespect to Max, I think we've upgraded in terms of our goalkeeper signing Shamal George from Colchester. He's the second highest transfer fee that we've paid at a grand total of 87 and a half grand, I believe it, I believe it was. And, but he certainly came with a very good reputation and his stats kind of back up. I think for a keeper under 25, he's got some of the best stats in Europe for, in terms of shots saved and things like that. So I think he'll be a big addition because since Liam Kelly, we've never really had a proper settled number one, mm. in my opinion. So I think Shamal will certainly be that for the next couple of seasons. He's the one that's really excited the fans to the point that we even announced it on the pitch prior to the Kelty Hearts game, which is a novelty <laughs> at Livingston announcing a signing on the pitch. It shows you how shows you how big time we are these days being yeah. a Premiership club. But um, <laughs> aye, it's, it's been a big difference this summer. I spoke to Davey a few weeks back. We had him on the podcast and he was talking about it. He's probably got a lot more continuity than he did this time last year in terms of, one, the backroom staff. There's been no turnover from that side of things, which he had last year for the first time in a number of years. But the squad last summer, it was 15, 16 players out the door and then in the door. So he's had a lot less on that front, which has probably probably helped us actually the start of this season and having a, a relatively decent start. Mm-hmm. League Cup group. I think it went to plan probably as, as good as it could. We had quite a tough draw in my eyes. We had Kelty Hearts, who are League 2 champions, Cove, who are League 1 champions, and then Inverness, who got to the playoff final as well. So we had quite a tough group. Two of the games we were playing for large spells with 10 men, <laughs> beat Albion Rovers, lost at Inverness, but we missed a last-minute penalty to rescue a point against Inverness, which would have probably seen us potentially finish top of the group anyway, <laughs> uh, taking them to penalties. Managed to dig out a result up at Cove despite playing 70 minutes with 10 men and then comfortably beat Kelty and, and managed to get into the hat, which is the idea with the League Cup as long as you're in the, in the draw. That's mm-hmm. that's what really matters. So, yeah, I think that was a as good an exercise as possible. But I've listened to Stephen Robinson's comments talking about St Mirren and he was saying <laughs> these League Cup games probably don't give a representation of how we'll play during the season. And I mm-hmm. think that's probably fairly accurate for us as well. We're not going to be a team that's going to dominate the ball week to week. Yeah. And that's how it was in these League Cup games. We're probably the team with the onus on us, which is not how we are going to play week to week. So I think the league games have given us, given the fans a much better representation of how we'll probably fare over the course of the season. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, this weekend is probably a fixture where Livingston may not expect to see large chunks of the ball as well. But I liked how you said, um, you know, you're not hammer throwers yet. Pai and Bovril tweeting out on Monday their, their stats in Livingston joint top um, of the Premiership most committed fouls with 62. So your response to that then? By the way, uh, look at the league, uh, league table for cards. We were the champions last year. That was the title we were coveted with winning the Yellow Card League. And we're... We're performing abysmally on that front so far this season. I think Dylan Bambula was on a mission to climb drag us up the table on Saturday when he came on for 15 minutes. But yeah, uh, yeah, I think if you actually watch us play, I think when you see these stats in isolation, it obviously looks worse. And we were playing Rangers in one of the games. We had a a away game at Tannadice as well and amongst that. So yeah, uh, the stats in isolation probably back up the old hammer throwers thing but I think if teams actually watch us play we're certainly not as big a hammer throwers as folk like to make out. No, well, especially when we've just come off the back of games against Motherwell and St Johnson who definitely probably live up to that more so than yourselves but I liked how we're almost going for the title of yellow cards obviously we're just sitting on the four yellow cards so far this season so maybe if we can't put some actual silverware in the trophy cabinet we'll we'll do a Livingston and claim that as a, a, a trophy instead. But, <laughs> um, this game also features um, two of the most fouled wingers in the league Vincente Bazaun and, and Stefan Omionga how much of a threat do you think um, Stefan Omionga can provide to the Aberdeen defence this, this weekend Stefan I mean Stefan typically plays in the midfield three 
Um, so far this season, it's been him, Jason Holt, and Sean Kelly, who's Sean Kelly's like a player reborn from when we signed him at the start of last season. He's he's gone from a, a left back that couldn't get a game at Falkirk to one of the first names in the team sheet as a sitting midfield player for us. It's just classic of David Martindale's recruitment, to be honest. He's he's like a Scottish Pirlo all of a sudden, Sean Kelly. He's been <laughs> he's been sensational. But no, um, talk about Omionga. Omionga is just a little buzz bomb in the middle of the park. He's He's a very typical Livingston player. He's very much in the mould of the likes of Scott Pittman, who's now a record appearance holder after the weekend there, and Jason Holt just ratting about in the middle of the park. He's very good on the ball, though, all my own guys. For his size, he's so difficult to get off the ball. His close control and little pockets is, is superb, but he's not a player that's going to grab you lots of goals throughout mm. the season or in terms of assists, but in terms of the the recoveries of the ball and little 50 50s getting a foot in, little toe on the ball, just retrieving possession for you. He's, he's absolutely sensational. And he's one of those really, he's one of those players that you can't help but love. He just plays the game with a smile on his face all the time. Every yeah. time you see him on the camera on like social media stuff, he's always grinning ear to ear. He's just a very infectious player, I think, around the place. And he's he certainly became a fan's favourite since he signed for us kind of this time last year. Yeah, I suppose on on Vicente, at least he won't need to worry about being assaulted by Max uh, on on this occasion. Um, yes, I did have to get that in there. Still um, maintain it went down easily. Um, <laughs> <laughs> reputation proceeded, did it? Aye, um, that's what it is. Aye. But obviously, you you know, you're saying that Stefan Omionga might not be someone that will grab Livingston goals, but will certainly prove a, a threat. I guess then this weekend, Livingston will be looking to Joel Nubley to to bag. Obviously, you know. I did the, the segment for your own podcast and, you know, Livingston have had a, a fairly decent start to the season, two wins, two defeats, albeit you said, you know, one of those defeats against Rangers in the second. And um, for those that want to hear you and rant about referees, uh, head over to the Talk Livy um, preview uh, or review, I should say, of the Motherwell game, because let's be honest, it was a very bewildering penalty decision that that cost you um, the defeat at, at, at Motherwell. So I guess you must be happy enough with, with the league start, six points on, on the board. But yeah, again, to Saturday, we'll be looking towards Nubley in that front three um, to provide the goals. Yeah, very satisfied with our start to the season. Very competitive against Rangers and two quick-fire goals is essentially what what's done us in that game. And I think we had opportunities prior to the goals to maybe extend our lead. Joe absolutely ragdolled Goldson and Suter and essentially the entire Rangers back for that day mm -hmm. he's oh, he must be an absolute nightmare to play against it he is such a big guy and you think he won't have a turn of pace you can't you can't try and be physical with him because he's just going to ragdoll you and turn you and spin you pin you and then you can't give him you know yards because he's got a surprising turn of pace yeah, <laughs> despite look at his goal against Hibs for an example of that yeah it's a perfect example granted some of the Hibs defending was a bit questionable yeah. within it but that's an example of how you can't let him just turn and run at you either so yeah last season Joel came back from our broth after a very successful first uh, half of the season with them and his play outside the box when he came back to us was unbelievable but in terms of his final end product in the 18-yard box and and the and the shape of assist goals was lacking. He didn't score. His first goal for us was against Rangers. Mm -hmm. But he's he's had a fantastic start to the season, albeit had a very quiet afternoon against Motherwell, but as did most of our team, in fairness, in that game. But yeah, Joel's if he's in the mood, he's he can be borderline unplayable. And certainly three games already this season, he has been most certainly unplayable. Mm -hmm. So if he's if he's in the mood against Aberdeen, they're in for a your centre half in for a long afternoon. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, Liam Scales and Anthony Stewart are prepared for what to come. But quiet games against Motherwell seems to be quite a common theme. <laughs> um, but formation wise, uh, looking at how Livingston have lined up this season, it seems to be a predominantly four three three. Although um, suggestions maybe the Motherwell game was Pittman and, and Shinny lay slightly deeper in a four three two one. Uh, formation, but no Bruce Anderson um, in the squad against Motherwell, um, and doesn't really seem to be getting much of a look in this season. Is that just purely down to the the shape that the Livingston have gone with this season? It's more down to fitness with Bruce. Uh, you know, he's missed the last probably six seven weeks of the last season uh, with an ankle injury, which he sustained. I'm 
I think it was just a kind of bizarre one where he rolled his ankle on training. It wasn't even in a game or anything like Those that. Those plastic pitches. Oh, hey, <laughs> absolute, absolute devil that is the plastic pitch. But, <laughs> no, I mean, Bruce is, so he kind of, he was probably two months behind everyone else prior to even going into pre-season. Mm. And I think he's, I think he had come back and decided he came off the bench against Hibs and was, and was very, very lively. But, I think he's maybe had another knock in training, which is why he's missed the game. I know we had a bounce game uh, prior to the Motherwell game during the week, so I don't know if he's he's done something in that, which is why he didn't feature. But Bruce was our top goal scorer last season with, mm-hmm. with 13 goals and was arguably one of the best signings in the in the Premiership last year, given that we got mm-hmm. money uh, to take Bruce and give you Jet. I mean, yeah. can't come on here and not mention that. <laughs> I, know. I know, I got the plastic pitches and you can get Jet and that's all. <laughs> but... No, Bruce, if Bruce is fit, I'm sure he'll certainly come into the side. But I think, given that we typically only play with one proper centre forward, Joel's obviously started the, the Rangers game, I think, for more tactical reasons in terms of getting us up the park, a bit more physicality up there. And he's, he had three excellent performances back to back, so you can't really drop him. But Joel has played out in the wide areas as well at times. So I think as the season goes on, Bruce will... Bruce will certainly be our number nine kind of going forward. And I think you Davy's already mentioned trying to accommodate the two of them playing together. So that that might account for a change of shape as the season goes on. But we've kind of carried on from last season playing a 4-3-3. I think we we started the Rangers game with Shinny and Pittman almost as two inverted tens. And I think mm. that was probably a tactical thing to because Rangers play with two sitting midfielders. I think it's probably to almost man mark them and granted the level of performances in the first the Rangers game were that good. He's just kept it going the first yeah. four games of the season and we got results against Dundee United and Hibs to kind of back that up. So you can't really change a win in sight. But the Motherwell game, it, it didn't work. And mm-hmm. I know listening to Davies' comments after that, he talked about maybe tweaking the shape ever so slightly. And I think that would maybe be in terms of going for two players who offer a bit more width. So it'll be interesting. I, I know you've mentioned that the two fullbacks get very far forward at Aberdeen. Mm-hmm. So he might try and exploit that by playing a little bit, well, a little bit more width in terms of players who will hug the lines and try and exploit that. Yeah. So from an Aberdeen fan's point of view, who should be the players outside of obviously New Blaine or Myonga who have mentioned, are there other players we should be watching out for this weekend likely to cause us problems? Or certainly in your mind, oh, cause us problems. Well, Nicky Devlin. It tends oh. to cause you a few problems in recent times up at Petodre. Mm. He seems to only score in the northeast of Scotland. <laughs> but actually, it's become a running joke. He's, his goals for Livy have been... He scored one up at Ross County. He scored two at Petodre. He scored one at Cove. And that's four of his five Livy goals. And then he was saying his only goals for United came up at Peterhead. So he seems to have a bit of a habit for grabbing a goal up there. <laughs> so hopefully Nicky can keep that trend going. But, you know, Nicky offers a threat in terms of... Um, coming forward from fullback, Christian Montano's had a, a fantastic start to the season playing at left back because uh, James Penrice has been out injured, but he's had a very, very good start to the campaign. Our midfield three, you know, has been typically kind of Holt, Omionga, and Kelly so far this season. Sean Kelly, as I mentioned, has been a bit of a player reborn. His delivery from set plays has been excellent, which is, I think, something we've lacked the last couple of seasons. And yeah, he'll he'll offer a bit of a threat. And I always kind of talk about Scott Pittman. Pittman's that midfielder out of our midfielders that has that bit of a nose for goal and can break lines and arrive in the box. And I'd certainly expect Pitts to be doing that as he normally would in terms of getting up and supporting the boy. Yeah, I suppose with the addition of New Blaine to your starting eleven, that's an extra height at those set pieces along with Fitzwater and, and Obelai as well. So again. You know, I've always said Livingston are a good set piece side, so something to to maybe watch out for. Certainly, the threat that they they pose in terms of the height you guys you guys have. But I suppose again, you know, it was a, a disciplined performance at Tannadice that saw you you come away with the win. I guess Davy Martindale will be looking for more of the same this weekend for for Livingston to keep that discipline. Obviously, you, you know, speaking there about your Premier Sports 
group stage game against Motherwell, you know, red cards have maybe seeped in a little bit. So discipline is definitely key this weekend. And, you know, a player I had marked as someone that has impressed me for Livingston was, of course, Shamal George, your goalkeeper. And you'll be looking for another inspired performance from him as well to to keep out the likes of Bojan Mayofsky this weekend. Yeah, Shamal. Shamal was a must, I think, in terms of saying. And don't get me wrong, I described Max... Strijek is a, a level par goalkeeper, use a golfing term. I think he <laughs> had some he had some incredible displays which won his points last season. But then for me, there was too many, too many big mistakes in his game. And I think that's that was the disappointing side with Max. Obviously, you guys will, will know very well. One of the mistakes <laughs> last season, early doors last season. And at the start of this campaign, Ivan Konovalov had made a mistake and in one of the Betfred games, Max got sent off. He also had, in one of the pre-season games, two comical errors in a friendly against uh, Green at Morton. So Davey instantly was was diving into the market. And mm-hmm. I think he's looked to Shamal George. And Davey's commented as well, as I mentioned earlier on, I don't think we've had a settled number one since Liam mm-hmm. Kelly was there. Our first season back up, we've had a lot of goalkeepers in on loan. And it's good to see that the club have backed them in terms of, I know it's, 87 grand doesn't sound like a lot of money, mm-hmm. but for a football club like us to go and pay any form of transfer fee is, is mm-hmm. big talk amongst Livingston fans. So yeah. he's got a decent pedigree, come through the academy at Liverpool. He's had a couple of very good seasons at Colchester. He got their player of the year last year. And as I said, he's got some very, very good stats. He is a big, big lad. He's 6'6". Mm-hmm. Six, six. He, is, he is a daunting presence between the sticks, big Shamal George. Uh, one thing I'll say about him is you can see the academy element of goalkeeping his distribution with his feet is excellent mm. I've, it's taken me really by surprise he <laughs> he's, he finds Joel Nubley or Christian Montano kind of with balls constantly and it's he gets it within about a yard half a yard every time it's, it's quite frightening his distribution so we signed him on a four year deal he's only the second player in our history to ever be given a four year deal so I think Davy sees it as maybe one that couple of years down the line he's he's going to impress and we'll probably sell him on for big money but mm. certainly it's good to get that position settled and nailed down going into this season because I think that was one one position that's let us, down, let us down last campaign and might have been the difference between us getting into the top six and challenging Europe. Yeah especially if you look at some of the as you said that the errors that, that Max liked to, to give us uh, last season as well so yeah obviously a, a disciplined performance is what you'll be hoping for obviously three points as well I mean obviously disagree on that but what are your realistic hopes for the game um, at the weekend? As you say go up there and, and frustrate I think if you look at the, the game at the tail end of last season I think we carried out a game plan to a T. they are, managed to keep Aberdeen very quiet albeit had a lot of the ball for the first 20-25 minutes but we sat in frustrated, got the Pataudry crowd kind of turning on the team. They were obviously struggling at that point as well. So, you know, it didn't take an awful lot to get them turning. <laughs> but, and we managed to go in at the break one up. So, and I think we deserved our three points that afternoon as well. It was a, almost a great day away performance for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything along those lines. And I think we've got an opportunity of getting a result again. But I think it's, I think we're coming up against a different animal where Aberdeen is. As I say, they've invested a lot in the squad, albeit I think that puts Jim Goodwin under pressure from the get-go. I know there's been a lot of money come in at Aberdeen, but I also think a club outside the old firm spending a million, million and a half pound on fees, mm. he's, he's got to get it right very quickly. So That's fair. Uh, I think that'll we can try and play on that as well. Try and, again, just go up there for straight, be very very difficult to beat and try and play on the counter-attack as we typically would away from home. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think we've shown in games this season against the likes of Rangers, we were not going to have a lot of the ball away from home at, at Tannadice after they came off the back of a fantastic result against Altmar. We went there and you know were the better side for large spells of that game. So at least an hour of that game, we were probably by far the better side. And then Hibs for about 70 minutes, we were the better side as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think we've we've got the tools at our disposal to certainly go up there and get a result, which we've shown in, in recent seasons. 
Yeah, well, we'll we'll see if that is the case again this weekend. But Ewan, thanks very much for joining me on Red Tinted Glasses to preview the game. Obviously, wish Livingston all the best for the rest of the season outside of games against Aberdeen. But um, for those that maybe want to hear your rant, or of course, you guys get quite good access to your manager as well. So maybe for some more insight into to David Martindale's thinking, where can they find the Top Living podcast? Yeah, so you can find Top Livy on Twitter at Top Livy. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram as well, on the all the usual podcast streaming sites, iTunes, Spotify, also on YouTube as well. So just search Top Livy. You can subscribe there as well. But as as you mentioned, Glenn, we we recently had an interview with the gaffer, and for anyone that's listens to Davy and his post match interviews, he's very open and honest. Well, he's certainly very open and honest with myself when he spoke to me as well. So. You get a very good insight as to what's going on behind the scenes at the football club, which I think is rare. I don't think you get a manager that's quite as open as, as he is, especially with a fan at the end of the day. So, mm-hmm. yeah, give that a listen because it's, it's for any Scottish football fan, I think it's quite a good insight. Yeah, well, perfect. I'm sure there'll be a few that, that do so. But, um, yeah, thanks again for, for joining me on Red and Glasses, Ewan. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Ewan uh, for joining me to look ahead to the weekend's game. Always great to catch up with him and the Talk Libby boys. Always a fun bunch to interact with. Callum, do you share the confidence that I had You know, for this weekend? I think that we, despite what Nublay and some of the threats Livingston mm-hmm. could pose, we, sh- we should really be looking at this game as three points. I think so. I mean, I th- we learned a few harsh lessons in, in the game against Motherwell. I think they were harsh lessons for the what lessons for the players as well. So hopefully, uh, with that experience, we'll be in a better position to go on and win this game. You know, Livingston are a good team. They're they're, they're organised. They've got you know the threats that we've mentioned uh, already on the show. But you know, it's a it's a home game against a team that'll probably be sort of mid table. We have to be looking to win this one. And um, if we are going to, you know aim for that top four like like uh, has been mentioned so yeah. it has to be three points for me which usually doesn't end us in a good place but uh, hopefully it's it's different this time you know with the experience from the Motherwell game yeah yeah absolutely I'm sure we'll be looking for some more memorable moments to come this weekend of course we forgot to ask you what your memorable moment from the St Johnson game is but I think it's fairly obvious what it's going to be and um, admittedly some of the mem- mem- some of the moments in the game not very memorable for my good self uh, until after my two St Johnston pies, which were lovely, but yeah, it, it's it's got to be as much as funny as the overhead kicks were. Uh, it's got to be that free kick, and um, you know, in absolute bedlam ensued. It was absolutely perfect into that top corner, a beautiful strike. So that's my memorable moment for the St Johnston game. Yeah, perfect. Well, of course, you won't be back to give your memorable moment. Phil will be joining me to look ahead to the Annan game and, of course, review the weekend's action against Livingston. Thanks very much to those of you that have tuned into this episode. If you're new on YouTube, hit that like button and also, of course, the subscribe button as well. And if you are new on audio, hit that subscribe button, whatever platform you may be listening to. Thanks very much for watching, Callum. I'll leave you with your good luck outro. It worked again last time, so yeah, yeah, yeah.